Balls to War, a sport report from 1170 AD to the present. When Thomas a Becket's clerk, William Fitzstephen, was suddenly forced to witness, against his will, the murder of Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, he fled to London, where he chanced upon a game. Not having seen it before, the clerk stopped to watch, and immediately found his attention was gripped, much more so than by the killing his king had just ordered, and which had driven Fitzstephen to run for his life. Despite the game's participants sometimes skidding, and, he noted, their falling onto their daggers, he saw that the game was safer than power politics, especially when footballers played it unarmed. Most did, he reported, before they stepped into the fray, and, writing in 1170, Fitzstephen declared that he preferred to see men fighting for balls and for goals than to see them fighting each other to death. After dinner, he wrote, all the youths of the city go out into the field for the very popular game of ball. He describes the trades having their own teams and adds, the elders, the fathers and the men of wealth come on horseback to view the contests of their juniors, and in their fashion sport with the young men. And there is aroused in these elders a stirring of natural heat by their viewing the joys of unrestrained youth. But there was more to the phenomenon than kicking balls, for it had often proved more exhilarating than work, and when it jeopardised the conduct of England's war games, then it provoked stern condemnation by authority. In 1314, Edward II tried to ban it, on the grounds that certain tumults arising from great footballs in the fields from which many evils may arise to the public, King Edward's aspersions had an ulterior motive. At the time, he was trying to raise an army to fight the Scots, and was worried about the impact football was having on his archers, whom he felt should be practising their skills for state-sponsored killings, and not for life-giving fun. James I decreed that na man play at the football, as its baying and shouting disturbed him. The Puritans outlawed it as a devilish pastime, and even Shakespeare described it as base. You slave! You... Not be struck, my lord! Nor trip neither, you base football player! Yeah! Football is nothing but beastly fury and extreme violence, wrote Thomas Eliot in 1531. Yet it was war by safer means, this decried peasant sport, all of whose rulers preferred games on horseback, and all of whom were suspicious of disparate groups coming together in a harmonious spirit in case they should use football as a pretext to rebel or to riot which sometimes they certainly did. In 18th century London, a posh West End street might serve as a goal mouth to an invading crowd. They'd boisterously breach its defences to help themselves, scoring armfuls of goods previously beyond reach. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Give us the ball, give us it. But football's subversive nature was unappreciated and its communal spirit disparaged. That is, until the cunning kings of commercialism saw how footballers could be farmed, and their skills commodified, and football used to flog fetish objects and cult costumes. Yet no one can ever buy the exhilaration of sprinting, pursuing a ball the shape of the world, and kicking it, knowing instinctively where it'll land and chipping it over the goalie into the net. Hey, I 
nothing if a man needs a, who's, who's playing in front of the public is being well paid and he doesn't dedicate himself to the job. I wouldn't, I would, I'd be hard on him. I'd, I would, if I could, I'd put him in jail. Out the road, as society, because he's a menace. Some people think football is a matter of life and death. I assure you, said Liverpool's manager Bill Shankly, it's much more serious than that. And his remark has gone down in history. Though by contrast, you can still see an angry graffiti somewhere near Fulham's Craven Cottage. Is football, it asks, all you morons can think about? It wasn't written by a Fulham supporter. But in Flanders, at the beginning of the First World War, football became the highest thought thinkable, for it trumped politics and it tamed belligerent powers. It drowned out the guns and kicked war into touch. The Germans in their trenches on the Western Front had been sent wartime care packages from home. They contained tiny fir trees to decorate with candles, Curious Brits peered over the trenches to watch. Then they listened as the Germans sang Heilige Nacht, whereupon Brits joined in with Silent Night. The Germans cried, You no fight! We no fight, Tommy! Then they all emerged, defying snipers' shots. They walked towards each other onto no man's land shaking hands and trying on each other's helmets. They swapped smokes and shared rum and schnapps. Everyone was ignoring their country's propaganda. Their excitable laughter would lighten the steel rain. From Lee Enfields and Maxim guns and Mausers. In this Christmas lull, someone produced a leather ball, clambering out with it on Christmas Eve 1914. The Scotsman dribbled the ball up and down the line, while others, looking about, made two goal mouths. One was formed from mounds of German forage caps, and the other from two piles of British greatcoats. Groups of bedraggled men played across frozen mud, amid shell craters and barbed wire. Lieutenant Johannes Nyman of the 133rd Saxons recalled the lone Scotsman with his ball, Tommy came out of the trench with one at his feet, kicking already and making fun. We soon discovered the Scots wore no underpants under their kilts, so that their behinds became visible any time their skirts moved in the wind. We had a lot of fun with that, Nyman would add. And in the beginning, we just couldn't believe it. He'd laugh as he remembered them larking about in the snow. The 133rd Saxon Regiment would beat the British 3-2, and the match took place at Pont Rouge. Then along the line there'd be more fraternisation, the ball's juicy thwacks upstaging gunshots. Though when the Lancashire Fusiliers took on the Germans, they only had a bully beef tin. Yet the score was diligently recorded. It was also 3-2, with Fritz promising Tommy a return match and Corporal William Hunt from Huckleton Colliery, serving with the Sherwood Foresters, said, Not the slightest notice is taken of shell bursts when a football match is on the go. Kurt Zamisch of the 134th Saxon Regiment wrote in his diary of a lively game and of how marvellously wonderful, yet how strange it was. The English officers felt the same way. Thus Christmas... Kurt wrote, the celebration of love brought mortal enemies together as our friends for a time. I told them that we didn't want to shoot on the second day of Christmas either, and they agreed. Kurt described a Thomas Laurie Frost of the first Cheshires bravely visiting the German trenches, holding plum puddings to swap for sausages. Each side called out, Merry Christmas. They then met up for a rare old jollification, as Frost put it, then a game. However, someone would photograph them all playing, and the photograph found its way to the war office, resulting in Whitehall's forbidding such 
fraternization. Football with the enemy was an unthinkable treason. For a crude hatred was willfully engendered by each side. The Kaiser commissioned anti-English hymns of hate. Troops learned Hathgesang gegen England, and schools adopted them as secondary national anthems. Equally in England, in the daily graphic you could read, Down with the Germans, down with them all, O army and navy, be sure of their fall, spare not one, the deceitful spies, cut out their tongues, pull out their eyes, down, down with them all, and troops would learn it, off by heart, to boost their morale, while their country was told that war was a sacred cause. And yet, on Christmas 1914, there was not an atom of hatred that day, said Bruce, Bairn's father of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. There was even mistletoe brought to the pitch from a Belgian wood, with bubbling cries of Kiss, kiss, cuss, cuss. Conan Doyle called the Christmas truce an amazing spectacle, saluting its pacifist horseplay, one human episode amid all the atrocities which have stained the memory of the war. Sherlock Holmes's creator detected a novel phenomenon, Although, at Luz, a British lieutenant colonel warned his men that he'd mow them down with a machine gun to end what he called outbreaks of intolerable sociability. It led Private Dawkins of the East Kents to comment, Had just one of these big mouths gathered together 10,000 footballs, what a happy solution that would have been, without bloodshed as Dawkins was wistfully to write home. Furthermore, if the rest of the First War had been replaced by a series of football matches, a few matches staged by some desk-bound big mouths, World War II need never have happened. Albert Camus, the French-Algerian philosopher, once swore that football had taught him everything. Far more is achieved by teams putting their egos on hold, by their altruistically giving and taking passes. The manager of Sheffield Wednesday spelt it out. It's amazing, said Howard Wilkinson, what can be achieved when no one is caring about who is getting the credit. The Robin Island prisoner of the South African regime showed football was more than just a game, when starting to play it in their cells with newspaper balls, held together with cardboard and rags. Then, through the Red Cross, they began a campaign to be allowed to play it in the prison yard. Anthony Sues, who'd had his youth stolen by apartheid, said, We played soccer with such passion. It is amazing to think that a game people take for granted all around the world is the same game that gave us prisoners sanity and, in a way, glorified us in a place trying to undermine us, it gave us hope. Prisoners in the isolation wing could follow their prison teams through a secret communication system and even found a way that they could watch all the games until the authorities built a wall to block their view. It's tempting to wonder why the American Empire is so feeble at playing the beautiful game. The rest of the world plays football but it's a version with no need for steel helmets and giant shoulder pads. And perhaps when a country's maddened and bankrupted by killing, through its spending limitless trillions on weaponry, then the required focus and the team spirit needed for goal scoring must fall by the wayside. Puerto Rico 10, US 0. What a great day for football, Shankly would exult. All we need is green grass and a ball. And Sam Allardyce gave football a novel perspective by putting it in a metaphysical context. There are scientists who will tell you that spirit, because it can't be measured, doesn't exist. Bollocks, said the manager of Bolton Wanderers. It does exist. And it's a spirit that survives. It survives McDonald's claiming Greece means happiness on every billboard of every stadium. It survives club 
ownership by billionaires seeking status, and it survives the cliched commentaries of know-alls, and it'll survive the power-crazed who use and misuse it, as long as there's a boy in a back street, in Sao Paulo, in Soweto, who bounces a ball on his head, and who giggles as he does so, again and again.